Well, hello. Um, thank you, Rosie, for leading us in worship. And thank you, everybody who's brought us to this point in the sermon. Uh, and now I'm going to talk to you. So I was thinking about Christian festivals and uh, all the festivals I've been to in my life, um, camping, living in the mud, all that other stuff, and how very much they are focused on young people. And when I was a young person, I wasn't so aware of that. But looking back on it now, I guess it is very apparent that that's what it was like. Uh, and I remember when I was 18 years old uh, in 1986, you can do the maths if you want to. I went to the Downs Bible Week down on the South Coast. And one of the preachers there talking about wouldn't be amazing if um, by the year 2000, it was then 14 years in the future, if by the year 2000 we could reach every people group in the world with the gospel. And um, obviously there's work still to be done then. But it, it still seems to be very much the case that when you go to these festivals, there's such an emphasis on young people and what are young people going to do? And young people rise up and take your place. And... Uh, and I arguably am not quite so young now as I once was. <laughs> so we're now in, in this position where if I turn up at one of these things and everybody talks about how amazing young people are, uh, that doesn't quite reach the same point with me as it used to before. Uh, and obviously, if I live uh, in 10 or 20 or 30 years when I'm 62 or 72 or 82, that kind of message is going to become less and less relevant to me. Now, obviously, I'm not saying there shouldn't be that focus, it's so important. Uh, and helping young Christians get started well in their lives is really valuable. Um, but I hope that we, we don't push that focus and the idea of how important young people are so much that, that everybody else uh, just feels like they're pushed out on the side. So is it as though uh, once you reach a certain age, God just loses interest in you? Uh, and if you were one of those bright young things who were 18 years old in 1986 uh, and it was all about what's God going to do in your life. Is it the case that when you get to 52, actually, um, it, it turns out that, that God's got better plans now because he's got newer, younger, more exciting people. And um, uh, Dan's nodding at me over here. He's, <laughs> he's in my congregation again today. Um, so obviously the answer is no, obviously. Uh, let me, for example, read you this uh, a brief couple of verses from Paul's letter to Titus. He says, teach the older men to exercise self-control, to be worthy of respect and to live wisely. And they must have sound faith and be filled with love and patience. And similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that honours God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Instead, they should teach others what is good. So obviously, God has plans for all of us, old or young, wherever we are in the journey of our faith or in the journey of our life, for that matter. And as we're coming towards the end of our series on David, you remember we started months ago before the COVID lockdown, and we're, we're now coming towards the end. One of the great things about the story of David is that it goes almost from, well, from his childhood all the way to his death. Uh, and we can learn from every stage of his life, from his youth, from his time as a young man, uh, as a mature man and as an older man, uh, there's, there's always something to be learned. And today we're looking at later in his life. And I want to look at the idea of ending well, coming to a good conclusion. Now, um, if you're in your 70s or 80s, maybe you're thinking, oh, at last, uh, a sermon that's not aimed at, at kids. Uh, and by kids, of course, I mean anyone under 40. But uh, <laughs> um, if you're not old yet, this is very relevant to you as well. And the reason is you want to be planning the trajectory of your life, the overall shape of your life, the direction it's going. Uh, really aiming for a goal, aiming, aiming to go from beginning to end. Now, of course, I don't mean the specifics of, of where you're going to move to and where you're going to live, what jobs you're going to do, uh, all that kind of stuff you can't predict years and decades in advance. And you don't need to. That's not important to to have planned out in that sense. When people talk about God has a great plan for your life, that kind of stuff isn't really the important part of it. The important part isn't where you'll go and what you'll do, but who you will be as you go to those places and as you do those things. And that really is what we want to focus on here. And I hope that however old or young you are, um, there's something here for you to learn from the, the later part of David's life. So when we think about the shape of David's life, um, it's actually a slightly sad thing when you notice it is that a lot of his greatest triumphs came early in his story. 
So if you think about the, the early messages in this series, we talked about Samuel anointing David as king when he was still a, a young boy in his early teens, maybe. And then, of course, the great story everybody knows about David and Goliath. Uh, and if you don't know it from the Bible, you should know it from the Fruity Tales version. And then stories that are less well known, but uh, that I think are just as important. And you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about when King Saul in his madness was hunting David to kill him and how David twice had the opportunity to kill Saul and passed it up because he forgave him. And how much that tells us about David's heart at that point and that he understood and appreciated God's forgiveness of him and that for that reason, he was able to be forgiving towards Saul. And then you remember Tim spoke to us about the great promise that God made to David about his always having a son on the throne of Israel and David's response to that. And yet then as you come into the second half of the story of David's life in the Bible, it's not so good. Uh, and obviously uh, last week we had the, the story about David's sin when he took another man's wife, Bathsheba, um, and then tried to cover it up by having that man killed in battle. Uh, and then David's repentance from that uh, was very real and very heartfelt, and it's given us one of the greatest of all of the Psalms, uh, Psalm 53, Psalm of Repentance. But it does almost feel as though that marked a transition in David's life, and from there on, uh, lots of things just seem to go badly. Uh, the very next story that we hear uh, actually in the Bible it is a, a awful one, really, about how David's son Amnon fell in love with his half-sister Tamar and raped her. And in response, David's other son Absalom then killed Amnon. So imagine one of your sons killing one of your other sons. It's an appalling time in David's life. Uh, and then that same son Absalom, the one who'd killed his brother, uh, overthrew David and usurped his throne. And there was a civil war in which David then had to fight against his own son. And when that son Absalom was killed, in the course of that war, David was distraught um, to the point where his own army commanders basically had to rebuke him and say, look, all, all your men who have fought for you and risked their lives and you're mourning over the person that they were fighting against. Um, so David returned to his throne after that. Another civil war broke out. Then later on, a yet another of David's sons, a guy called Adonijah, proclaimed himself king while David was still alive. And then before that could be blow up into yet another war, um, David instead anointed his other son Solomon to be the king who would succeed him. So there's a lot of sons involved in this story. Um, but I suppose the key, key point to take away here is just that the later part of David's life didn't go as well as the first part. And then we just need to think about how did he respond to that? How did that affect his character? How did that affect his relationship with God and with his sons? <clears throat> and it's not all good news. Uh, let's look at David's final words. So we're now in the first book of Kings, chapter two, and I'm going to read the first uh, four verses. As the time of King David's death approached, he gave this charge to his son Solomon. I am going where everyone on earth must someday go. Take courage and be a man. Observe the requirements of the Lord your God and follow all his ways. Keep the decrees, commands, regulations and laws written in the law of Moses so that you will be successful in all you do and wherever you go. If you do this, then the Lord will keep the promise he made to me. He told me, if your descendants live as they should and follow me faithfully with all their heart and soul, one of them will always sit on the throne of Israel. Now, if only David had stopped there, if only those had been his last words, but he continued and here's what he said. And there is something else. Remember Shimei, son of Gerar, the man from Bahurim in Benjamin. He cursed me with a terrible curse as I was fleeing to Manaheim. When he came down to meet me at the Jordan River, I swore by the Lord that I would not kill him, but that oath does not make him innocent. You are a wise man, Solomon. You will know how to arrange a bloody death for him. Then David died and was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. Now, look, these are the very last recorded words of David, a man who'd lived an incredible life and who's described 
multiple times in the Bible as being a man after God's own heart. Yet his very last words were words of revenge. Now, the crazy thing is that his life had been defined really by forgiveness. You think about him forgiving Saul uh, and doing so twice, in fact. You think about God forgiving him after he sinned with Bathsheba and stole Uriah's wife. David was a man who forgave and had been forgiven, and yet he ended in forgiveness. And the terrible thing in, in revenge, sorry, not in forgiveness, in revenge. The terrible thing about this is that the whole thing with Shimei had been resolved with grace back when it happened. So just to remind you what was going on here, I'm just going to quickly act out for you the story of David and Shimei. So here's David, uh, and he is fleeing from Jerusalem because his son Absalom has taken the throne. And he's walking along, and with him is Abishai, the commander of David's army. And as they're making their way along, don't laugh, this is serious. <laughs> Up comes Shimei. And Shimei is all, oh, David, you've got what you deserved. Hur, hur, hur. And Abishai is, David, why do you allow this dog to insult you? Let me go and kill him. And David holds him back. And David says to Abishai, no, this isn't a time for killing. Uh, maybe this is God's will. Maybe God doesn't want me to be king anymore. Maybe God has told Shimei to curse me. So David in that situation, again, a man in some ways defined by forgiveness, forgives Shimei and lets him go. And then after that war is over, after David's son Absalom is killed and David in sadness, nevertheless, returns to the throne, uh, he meets Shimei again. And now I'm going to read to you from the second book of Samuel, chapter 19. As the king was about to cross the river on his way back to Jerusalem, Shimei fell down before him. My lord, the king, please forgive me, he pleaded. Forget the terrible thing your servant did when you left Jerusalem. May the king put it out of his mind. I know how much I sinned. That's why I have come here today, the very first person in all Israel to greet my lord, the king. And then Abishai, son of Zeruiah, said, Shimeo should die, for he cursed the Lord's anointed king. Well, who asked your opinion, you sons of Zeruiah? David exclaimed. Why have you become my adversary today? This is not a day for execution, for today I am once again the king of Israel. And then turning to Shimei, David vowed, your life will be spared. Now here is David responding with grace to a difficult situation just as he did those times that Saul was hunting him down and trying to kill him. It's brilliant demonstration of the best of David. And you would think, wouldn't you, that that would be the end of the story of David and Shimei, that that would be the conclusion. And at the end of it, David would come out as a man of grace, a man after God's own heart. But obviously it didn't work out that way. Now, there's a, a kind of dark echo here of a, a very familiar phrase from the New Testament. His Here's a good thing, and then I'll show you the bad thing. At the end of the nativity story, uh, when Jesus is born in a stable and the shepherds visit and the angels sing, at the end of it all, Luke tells us, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Now that's brilliant, kind of treasuring up in the heart of something that God has done and letting it define her. And that would have been a crucial part. Of, of what Mary's character was like in the years and the decades that followed that. But here's the kind of dark shadow of that. It's the opposite of it, is that David obviously nursed the grudge that he had against Shimei. You could even use those same words. You could say he treasured up all these things and pondered them in his heart. But in David's case, they weren't building him up. They were poisoning him. Now, this too easily happens with us as well, doesn't it? I wonder how many of us have had a similar kind of experience, even if a thing where we just shrug it off at the time and say, oh, it's OK. But then something stays like a splinter in the heart. You know, I once had a Christian friend, in many respects, uh, a fantastic Christian, but he had, a, you could almost say it was a curse on him. There was someone he hated so much that he just couldn't drop it. And I once went to that friend and I, I reminded him of Jesus's words in Matthew's gospel, chapter six, verses 14 and 15. You probably know them. Jesus says, if you forgive people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive people their sins, 
your father will not forgive your sins. Now, my friend knew that and he understood it. And what he said to me is, I understand that and I'll accept the consequences. Now, how does a grudge get to a point where it means that much to you that you'll risk eternal life for it? Well, I don't think it happens overnight. I think he fed that grudge. I think he, he luxuriated in it on some level. He must have even enjoyed it. But while it was happening, it poisoned him. And earlier, I used the image of a splinter in the heart. If you think about just a splinter in your finger, when if you're gardening or something and you come in afterwards and you notice just a little speck in your finger, it's nothing, it doesn't look like anything. But if you don't deal with it, it becomes infected. Uh, and then within a day or two or three days, what was a tiny, tiny thing that didn't matter has become a constant throbbing pain that you're always aware of and always stays with you. And it seems to me that's what happened with David. I think his grudge against Shimei, he just couldn't let it go. And it got embedded in him and it became infected. Here's what the writer to the Hebrew says. This is in the New Testament, chapter 12, verse 15. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Now, one of the things I like about this is it's not just about one person. It's not just solo. It isn't just you've got to make sure uh, that you don't resent people. It's put in a context of community. So the first part of it, remember, is look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. In this context, meaning so that none of you hangs on to resentment. So each of us can influence all the others and we can help each other to put aside our grudges and our resentments and our unforgiveness. But also, because this is embedded in community as well, that doesn't just have the good effects that we can all help each other to get out of this. It also has the bad effects that the consequences spread. Because the second half of that verse, again, Hebrews 12, 15, was watch out no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Because when any one of us becomes unforgiving and carries a grudge, that doesn't only affect us, it affects others. So let's see how that happened. Let's think about what Solomon actually did after he became king. It's uh, the next thing that follows on from David's last words in the passage that we read earlier. Well, the first thing Solomon did is this. Do you remember Adonijah, Solomon's brother, had proclaimed himself king just before Solomon was anointed as king? Uh, Solomon had Adonijah killed. Well, I can only think that he had learned something of unforgiveness from David. The next thing Solomon did, second thing he did, remember this is supposed to be one of the wisest kings that ever, li ever lived. And yet, because of the legacy David had left him, the next thing he did was kill Joab. Now, Joab had been the commander of David's army earlier in his life and had turned against David and had killed various people. So what did Solomon do? Took revenge against Joab. And then the third thing that Solomon did, the third thing he did after becoming made king, at least the third thing we're told about in the Bible, Again, I'm going to read to you. First book of Kings, chapter two. It's the same chapter we were reading earlier. Then King Solomon said to Shimei, you certainly remember all the wicked things you did to my father, David. May the Lord now bring that evil on your own head. But may I, King Solomon, receive the Lord's blessings. And may one of David's descendants always sit on this throne in the presence of the Lord. And then at the king's command, Beniah, son of Jehoiada, took Shimei outside and killed him. So the first three things that Solomon did were all acts of revenge. Revenge against Adonijah, who tried to take the throne that was supposed to come to him. Revenge against Joab and then against Shimei, who David had clearly, clearly and explicitly forgiven. So David's legacy to Solomon, the thing he left behind to his son, was bloodshed. He didn't just hold grudges himself. He passed them on to his son. And this, I think, is, is what that um, verse in Hebrews is, is alluding to. Not this particular incident, but this phenomenon, the way things can happen. 
is when it says, watch out, no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. In this case, David let his poisonous root of bitterness grow up to trouble him, but it also corrupted Solomon. So, what do we learn from this? Well, everything we do is building our legacy. And I suppose as we get older, we start thinking a little bit more about what we're going to leave behind us. But we can't choose which parts of what we do become our legacy. So in David's case, obviously, he left behind lots of fantastic things. The story of how he defeated Goliath through trusting God and all of those amazing psalms, the fantastic psalm of repentance we talked about earlier. Uh, and Tim is going to take us through some of David's psalms next week. And we'll see some of the very positive parts of David's legacy. But also... Uh, he left behind some very negative things as well. Um, and possibly each of us now, as we look at our lives and we think about, well, what are we going to leave behind when we're gone? How are we going to be remembered? What will people take from our lives? Maybe we're concerned about the things we've done that we're not pleased about or satisfied with, or which we know that God doesn't approve of. So what can we do? Well, the past is gone. There's no point in our agonizing over it. Now, we can make amends for things that we've done that are wrong, for sure, but we can't change the past. What we can do is decide what we're going to do now. How are we going to live now? How are we going to live going forward? In David's case, when he came to the very end, he had a chance to end well by passing on to Solomon all of his wisdom and knowledge and love for God. Now, David among the Psalms that he wrote are some of the most fantastic outpourings of understanding of God's greatness and kindness and forgiveness. And you would hope, wouldn't you, that as David came to the end of his life, those would be the things he was passing on to Solomon. But actually, even if you look at the good parts of what we read earlier, the, the good parts of his closing words to Solomon, even those, they're mostly about just follow God's laws, almost as though it's saying stay on the right side of God. And I, I don't know whether I'm over-interpreting here, but I almost feel as though in those last decades of David's life, he had lost some of his love for God and his understanding of God's goodness and kindness. And perhaps instead, he'd been reduced to thinking more in terms of just, you've got to stay on God's right side, seeing him not as a loving father, but as a stern judge. Now, God is a stern judge, but he is also a loving father. And I wonder whether when we look at David's last words, we see his idea of who God is has tips over much more into that stern judge aspect. And I really wish that we could go back to 1 Kings chapter 2 and, and read David's last words and find that they were an exhortation to know and to love God. But sadly, that's not what David left. Now, here's the thing. We have a choice to do better than David did there. He chose in the end to let the very end of his life be defined by bitterness, by anger, by revenge. We can choose not to do that. Not only at the end of our life, obviously, now and tomorrow and the day after and onwards. The choices that we make now resonate downwards and they may even have consequences after we die, just as David's choices had consequences in Solomon's behaviour. But it is never too late to shape your legacy. It's never too late to change what kind of person you are and what you're going to leave behind. And for younger people, it's never too early to make a start on that. All the while, you are about the process of becoming the person that you are going to be. And I want to finish really by thinking about the, well, the opposite of David's last words, which uh, unsurprisingly, it's Jesus's last words. We think about, well, good look at any of the things Jesus said on the cross, but in particular, uh, almost the last words as Luke records them. As he was dying, as he was looking at the people who were responsible for that death and who had caused it, the prayer of Jesus was this, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And compare that with David's last words, which were, you're a wise man, you'll know how to bring him to a bloody death. What a difference. So really, we 
although there's so much that's good about David in his life that we can learn from, and, and we have been looking at those in the last few weeks, the way his life ended, I think is a stern warning to us. And if we look at David on one side and Jesus on the other, let it please be that we live our lives in such a way that we finish the way that Jesus finished and not the way that David did. So my plea to you is whether you're old, whether you're young, whether you're a brand new Christian, whether you've been a Christian for 50 years, if you have any grudges that you've been nursing, if you have any resentment, any bitterness, even if it's something that's justified, even if it's something that somebody really did do to you and they really were unambiguously in the wrong. Just as shimmy, I was unambiguously wrong in cursing and throwing rocks at David. Whatever it is you resent, just take that splinter out. Don't let it go septic. If it started to go septic, take it out. Apply the antiseptic of God's love. Just don't let the root of bitterness grow up. And let it be that when you come to the end of your race, you're able to pass on blessings to the people you know and not curses. Thank you, Jesus, that you in this, as in everything else, just give us the perfect example of how we should live. And thank you that in your death, as in your life, you showed us the right way to be. And that just as you forgave throughout your life, so you forgave as you died. Great God, help us please to aspire in this way, to live the life of Christ that is in us. Thank you that you have looked on us with unending forgiveness, that there doesn't come any point in our pathetic failures when you look and say, all right, that's enough. I'm not forgiving Mike anymore. I'm not forgiving Tim anymore. That point never comes. You keep forgiving it. And let it please be now that we, as your sons and daughters, live the way that you have showed us. Let it be that we are those who refuse to cherish resentments, who just pull out the splinter and walk away and leave behind a legacy of grace, just as you have given us grace. In Jesus' name. Amen.